Ms. Tatho. Chair Smith, Co-Chair Merkley, and other distinguished members of the Commission, thank you for your steadfast and groundbreaking leadership on the Tibetan issue. Thank you for this honor to be able to speak here today. I just want to start um, by speaking, making it clear that I am speaking of Tibet as Tibetans know it. The entire Tibetan plateau, 900,000 square miles, made up of three historical provinces of Utsang, Kham, and Amdo. And with a total Tibetan population of what is today around 7 million Tibetans. China misleadingly claims that there are only 3.2 million Tibetans in Tibet because they count only the Tibetans in the Tibet Autonomous Region. That is central and western Tibet, mostly. They've taken all of eastern Tibet and they've carved up and sub-fragmented Tibetans and the lands that they live on into four Chinese provinces and 12 autonomous count, uh, prefectures and counties. And in this way, they distort and confuse people about what is the true picture inside of Tibet. For 70 years, generation after generation of Chinese leaders have tried to break the faith and the loyalty of the fiercely independent Tibetan people to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, to Buddhism, and to a distinct Tibetan identity that existed for well over a thousand years before the People's Republic of China was even founded. But after using countless strategies, resources, and unimaginable violence, Xi Jinping now believes the best way for China to conquer Tibet is to kill the Tibetan in the child. He's doing this by taking nearly all Tibetan children away from their families and from the people who will surely transmit this identity to them, not just their parents, but their spiritual leaders and their teachers. And he's handing them over to agents of the Chinese state to raise them to speak a new language, practice a new culture and religion, that of the Chinese Communist Party. A little over a year ago, of a, a little over a year ago, Tibet Action released a report showing that at least 800,000 Tibetan children are now living in a massive network of boarding primary, middle, and secondary schools across all of historical Tibet. This shockingly high number means that at least three out of every four Tibetan children in all of historical Tibet from ages six to 18 are now separated from their families and living in a state-run colonial boarding school system where the medium of instruction and the entire curriculum is focused on fostering loyalty to China. Tibetan is taught as a single language class, if at all, and Tibetan culture is most often reduced to nothing more than dance and song and tokenized wearing of traditional Tibetan clothing. The practice of Tibetan Buddhism is, of course, strictly prohibited. China doesn't hide the fact that these schools exist. There's plenty of online propaganda claiming the students in the boarding schools are happy and receiving a modern education. This propaganda nearly always features very prominently that single Tibetan language class. But what it hides and what is not included in our report is the existence of boarding preschools. Though we were hearing reports from Tibet that parents were being forced to send children as young as four and five away, we could not find any details on where they were being sent or what schooling they were receiving. It was only on the eve of actually releasing our report that we met an expert eyewitness who'd recently fled from Tibet and who confirmed the existence of the mandatory boarding preschools for children living in rural areas of Tibet. Dr. Gello, a Tibetan academic who holds a PhD from the University of Toronto and has over 30 years of experience in the field of education in Tibet and China, estimates that an additional 100 to 150,000 Tibetan children at least ages four to six years old now live in these boarding schools. He's visited more than 50 himself. He's seen the children are required to live there Monday to Friday, where they're immersed in a completely Chinese learning environment, including participating in war reenactments where they're dressed in PLA uniforms or Red Army suits. One Tibetan teacher describes the situation in her area like this. Usually there are very few Tibetan teachers. The majority are Chinese. So teachers only speak in Mandarin and conduct all school curriculum in Mandarin, including nursery rhymes and bedtime stories. 
When the children join primary school, hardly any of them can speak Tibetan. Dr. Gela witnessed the impacts of these preschools in his own family when just after three months of being in one, children in his family who'd grown up in an entirely Tibetan-speaking household preferred to speak in Chinese. He saw them growing emotionally distant from their parents and grandparents and acting like, as he says, guests or strangers in their own home. Imagine your loved ones at this age and try to imagine the heartbreak that this is causing for these families. I have a six-year-old and three-year-old twins, so I'm right now fully immersed in this period of childhood development. Kids at this stage need the care of their parents and their families to help them eat, bathe, get dressed, and maybe even more importantly, to scare away the monsters at night, to comfort them when they're sick or hurt, and to reassure them that everything is gonna be okay. Tibetan parents don't wanna send their kids away, and most wouldn't if they had a choice. Some parents refuse and many more want to, but China's repression makes the price of resistance extremely high. In order to avoid sending kids away, some families, families split up, sending one parent to live with the child in an urban area where they can t attend a day school, and other parents report sleeping in cars near the boarding preschools just so that they can be close to the kids at all times. And of course, the children are suffering too. Research by scholars in China and Tibet clearly shows that the removal of Tibetan children from their homes, as well as the highly regimented and isolating boarding school life, is traumatizing Tibetan children. First-hand accounts of Tibetans who attended boarding schools in Tibet show that pervasive racism and discrimination will inevitably lead them to develop feelings of shame and ethnic inferiority. These impacts in Tibet sound hauntingly similar to the residential boarding school system used to eliminate indigenous identities in Canada, the US, Australia, and beyond. This is because Chinese leaders are pursuing the same strategy for the same reasons in Tibet, East Turkestan, and Southern Mongolia, to quell resistance and to consolidate China's rule over foreign lands and peoples. And while Chinese officials argue that the schools in Tibet are fundamentally different from boarding schools of the colonial era, in part because students get to attend schools with modern facilities, they miss the point entirely that what matters is what Tibetans want for their children. And Dr. Gello likes to simplify this issue in another way by saying it's not about how good the school facilities are, but what is happening inside the fundamental question is who is teaching what to whom? And in Tibet, the answer is clear. The Chinese state is removing Tibetan children from their homes by force or coercion and placing them in schools where they have to speak Chinese to conform to Chinese culture and tradition while stripping them of their own identity, including their religion and their mother tongue. If this is not colonial education, I don't know what is. And when viewed together with the all-out attack on Buddhism and the nomadic way of life, we can see China intends to destroy everything that makes Tibetans Tibetan. And calling it ethnic unity or ethnic fusion or assimilation or sinicization doesn't make it different or any less colonial than what was done by Canada and the US and Australia to First Nations, Indigenous and Aboriginal people. And what it is is crystal clear to Tibetans, just as it's crystal clear to Uyghurs and Southern Mongolians. China's committing genocide in Tibet. And at a time when our nations are finally reckoning with these atrocities, that Xi Jinping is pursuing a strategy targeting children for the elimination of language and culture, a colonial strategy now reviled and condemned around the world, should be, along with the Uyghur genocide, a massive red flag for the international community of the true nature and intention of the Chinese Communist Party. But this doesn't have to be the end of the story. Tibetans inside Tibet have not stopped fighting. We hear the stories of their resistance every single day. And our Uyghur, Mongolian, Southern Mongolian, Hong Kong, and Chinese activist brothers and sisters are fighting too. Now is the critical time for the world to step up and help. And I'll end there and um, address my recommendations in the Q&A. Thank you. 